Good evening. Please be seated. We're going to get started pretty soon, probably in like five seconds. <laughs> okay. President Garvey, distinguished guests, alumni, friends, faculty, students, and staff, good evening. Um, I'm so pleased to see all of you here. Thank you so very much for coming. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to, to welcome you to the centennial celebration of the School of Library Information Science. We are deeply honored that President Garvey is able to be with us uh, for a little while this evening and to join us in our celebration. I would like to invite him to, up to, to come up to the uh, podium to say a few words of, to us. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, Ingrid, and thank you all for, for coming. It's, a, it's really an honor for us to have so many distinguished people from the field of library and information science here. I, I want to especially welcome um, Susan Hildreth and Maureen Sullivan and Ann Caputo, who are on the, who are, uh, on the panel here, and, and uh, Maureen's husband, Jack Siggins, the university librarian at GW, is here. Blaine Desi, the director of the Federal Library and Information Network. Sam Clay, who's the director of the Fairfax uh, County Public Library System. Cynthia Henderson, the Executive Director of Howard University's um, Health Sciences Library, and Pat Evans, the se a senior researcher at the Supreme Court, and a number of other distinguished librarians. I, um, and I want to congratulate the School of Library and Information Science here that uh, we began teaching um, librarians a hundred years ago this year, and it's a real um, a remarkable achievement. I think the university itself celebrates its 125th anniversary this year, so the work of the of library and information sciences is not much younger than the university itself. So it's a it's a really great thing, and in, uh, it continues to uh, to flourish. I, just recently, we celebrated a grant of more than four million dollars from the Department of Labor for our health information technology program, uh, a master's program that we began last year. This is uh, a grant that we're operating in conjunction with the Metropolitan School here. Um, and I, I wanted to say for my own part how um, I, I, I was just talking before with some of the uh, some of the panelists and others about how interesting I found the field of library and information sciences. I, I was reading a book this summer called Moonwalking with Einstein. I don't know if you've, any of you have read this. It's about, it's about uh, memory abilities. Uh, uh, this was something that, that in Cicero's time people wrote books about and it was part of the usual rhetorical training of uh, public speakers. Uh, the book begins by making the observation that nowadays we, we um, carry all of this kind of information on external drives, as it were. <laughs> um, I used to know my wife's phone number. I no longer do because I just say Gene and my, <laughs> and my phone will call her. He, um, and it's the same way with, um, I don't know, it's the same way with my children and mathematical tables. That, uh, somebody had the bright idea that kids didn't need to learn times tables because they would always have computers, forgetting that if you can't do times tables in your head, you can't do fractions, you can't do long division, then you can't factor polynomials, and so on and so on. So there are some, there are some reasons to keep all of this in your head. Anyway, it is true nonetheless that the amount of information that people have to operate is so massive that nobody can possibly carry it around in his or her head anymore. And uh, it, it's become a, almost a sort of metaphor for the way in which the world is becoming more complex so that we have librarians worrying about what Ingrid tonight told me was called metadata, which is how we um, store the data externally that we're searching for. I, I don't have metadata files in my head. I don't know how I recall things, but I think it's a different system. Um, anyway, um, all of this has an effect on your all's work and the work of librarians. Um, I noticed within the legal system, uh, within legal education, the cost of running libraries continues to go up. 
for several reasons. One, the volume of information continues to go up. Two, uh, the number of people that you need to instruct people about how to retrieve information goes up because information technology has gotten blended into libraries. On the other hand, the space itself has changed. It used to be you walk into any um, famous um, library, uh, the Supreme Court's library or the Langdo Library at the Harvard Law School, or they, they always have massive reading rooms with high ceilings and, and uh, pretty inscriptions written around the outside, and you think what a nice place this is to, to be in. Well, it serves a purpose that doesn't really exist anymore. Reading rooms like that existed because you would put regional reporters and statutes uh, on the walls because they didn't circulate because everybody needed them and you only could uh, afford so many copies of them. So everybody, they, they were, it was a common space for people to use those books and you needed a room big enough to store the books and a room big enough to house the people who came there to read them and you wanted high ceilings so that the noise of one wouldn't bother the other. So we have these big, beautiful reading rooms pointless now because nobody reads the books because they go on computers and download them from Westlaw or, or they do it from home. So it changes the shape of libraries and the, the function of the space. So we need to, th this causes us in the first place to think about how should we design buildings. And then the data itself, you know, you all have to worry endlessly, I'm sure, about what format you're going to collect data in. Are you going to get uh, serial sets or are you going to get um, you know, B&A or Commerce Clearinghouse, or are you going to you're going to get them online? If you get them online, then you don't own them anymore, and every year you have to buy them all over again to uh, to get them. And you also don't know, um, you know, if you if you get them on. Remember, for a time there was a fashion about getting compact discs or DVDs. I forget what they were, but they didn't last very long. You know, they they'd get scratchy and you couldn't search on them. Uh, so you need to worry: Are they going to be as durable as microfiche is? Or is digital format going to be as durable as... Anyway, so you have to worry about all of these things and then how to pay for it because uh, that's those costs keep going up. And Anyway, I, I just I just want to say for my own part how fascinating I think the, the field itself is, how immensely complicated and how important in a world where we store all of our information externally, you all are in charge of helping us find it. <laughs> so thank God for that. And training people how to do it. So thanks for coming with us to celebrate the important work that the School of Library and Information Sciences does. Thanks to our alumni for coming back to visit us again, and thanks to our distinguished visitors for coming and helping us celebrate the event. And thanks for having me tonight. Thank you, President Garvey, for the warm remarks. We are greatly encouraged by your presence and also by your support. Um, this year, we celebrate 100 years of our effort in library education and 30 years as a school. It all got started in 1911 when the librarians from the DC Public Libraries offered summer courses at the Catholic University of, of America. And in 1981, Dr. Elizabeth Stone envisioned a school that, could, that would develop library leaders with strong professional ethics and a commitment to a more just and compassionate society. And her success in convincing the university to elevate the Department of Library Science to the School of Library Information Science marked our beginning as a school. Many years later, now what we have is that we have many leaders, uh, many graduates from our program that are leaders in public schools, uh, in public libraries, academic libraries, school libraries, and special libraries. And if you look at, take a quick look ar around the room, I think that you will agree with me that we have made tremendous progress. We have made a lot of progress in advancing knowledge, in providing services, and extending the discovery in the information world. Many of you have contributed to this process and to our progress. And so I would like to extend my gratitude to all of you for your hard work. And tonight, as we celebrate the school, we also celebrate you and your contribution to the school and, to the, and the field. Um, as, the, as we celebrate the school and our achievement, we are also preparing for the future. 
And it's, uh, I'm deeply grateful that we uh, have three leaders from the field, Anne Caputo and Susan Hildreth and, and uh, Marlene Sullivan. These are the top leaders of the field. They honor us with their presence and they are coming here to share their insights with us and to share, uh, to have the discussion with us about the future of the libraries. Um, Marianne Gilchard, in a few minutes, will be introducing them and get our program started. Before we get there, I do want to say a word of appreciation to our alumni, our staff, and our students for making tonight's event possible. Uh, thanks again for coming. I really appreciate your presence here, and I hope you enjoy tonight's program. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marianne Giltrude, and I have the honor of introducing each of our speakers. Um, I'll intro introduce them before they speak. They'll speak for about 15 minutes or so, um, and then at the end, we'll have a moderated question and answer uh, period. Um, our first speaker is Anne Caputo, who is the 2010 past president of the Special Libraries Association and the executive director of Dow Jones Learning and Information Professional Pro Program. With extensive experience in knowledge and information services, Anne specializes not only in the planning and development of learning initiatives, but also in strategic planning, marketing, and outreach. As an adjunct faculty at the University of Maryland College of Information Service and a member of the distance education faculty at the University of Tennessee, Anne teaches access to electronic information in a digital world. In addition to being an SLA 2008 fellow, Anne served at the international level on the SLA's board as well as serving at the local level as a director and later as president of the DC chapter of the Special Libraries Association. These represent a small selection of Anne's prestigious honors. However, one would, not, would be remiss not to mention that when Anne graduated library school, she took it upon herself to learn how to search dialogue and become proficient in using that tool. Her dedication and ingenuity grew and developed so that she became an, a de facto expert for Dialogue's class, classroom instruction program and the directorate of the Dialogue's quantum information professional program. Whether teaching about information services, leading a national and international organization, planning instruction, and developing programs, Anne is always future ready. We welcome Anne Caputo to the Catholic University of America School of Library and Information Science Centennial Celebration Library Leaders uh, Luminary Panel. I give you Anne Caputo. And technology guru. <laughs> uh, thank you, Marianne. And one of the things in my career that I have been most proud of that was actually not mentioned is the 22 years I spent teaching here on the adjunct faculty. And I see Scotty out there, and I see David and Key and others of you who were there with me at the beginning in 1978 when I started as a very, 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 very young adjunct faculty member uh, walking up the stairs of Marist Hall, the legion, legions of stairs in Marist Hall, trembling at the thought of reading one chapter ahead of all the other students in my class. And that was the beginning of my um, interest in education and in mentoring and in teaching that remains to this day as one of the things I am very most proud of. So. I am honored to be asked to come back here and represent SLA, but I'm also honored to be part of your family as well. Let me tell you first what I am not going to talk about. I am not going to talk about public libraries because the last time I was in one of these events, and I did, and Jenny Cooper was in the audience following me, I nearly had to run for my life <laughs> because <laughs> While I feel passionately about public libraries and the good they provide in society, I know really next to nothing about them. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to instead represent the Special Libraries Association and talk about special corporate government and all the other myriad of libraries that SLA represents. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of thinking about their future. 
and I'm hoping that I can say one or two things that will um, be controversial enough for you to ask questions about, challenge me, or dispute before the evening is over. So I'll start by telling you um, that. When I was SLA president, one of the occasions of, of giving a talk at our annual conference involved speaking to about 300 of our leaders who are chapter and division leaders. And I had an idea that I would do something startling. And I'm not going to do it tonight, but I thought of it. It takes too long. I had a PowerPoint presentation in which the opening slide was completely blank. And as we stood there in silence, we watched the names of all of the special libraries that had been closed in the past year appear one by one in sort of random order on the screen until after about three minutes, the screen was completely black. Why is this happening? How could this happen? We live in a time when information is ubiquitous. It is needed in all kinds of organizations. It is the key to com competition and success. And yet special libraries are closing even as we speak. I think we need to think more carefully about our roadmap. Lewis Carroll said, if you don't know where you're going, any road is going to get you there. So we need a roadmap to know not only where we are going, but how we can get there, how our landscape can be understood, and how we can plan for a success in a career that offers skills that are so essential to our organizations. We live in a time, and I'm not, I am speaking clearly, clearly, clearly to the choir here, uh, of information and knowledge explosion. There are, I can spend the next hour giving you statistics about that, but just for example, each month we know that there are about 19 billion Twitter posts. 19 billion. That's five times the number of searches done on Bing. There are about 95 billion Google searches every month. And five years ago, that number was 2.7 billion. So we are living in a time of exploding information. Information everywhere, information of every kind and every kind of quality. At a time when so much information exists, we need a roadmap and a guide. And that's what we are. But we are not well recognized as that. It took radio 38 years to reach an audience of 50 million people. It took television about 13 years to do the same. It took the internet once it became in the dot-com world about four years to reach 50 million people. Facebook only two years to reach 50 million people. And Twitter eight months to reach 50 million people. And I can go on and on, and I will not. But we live in a time when information explodes around us, but we need guides in order to follow it. So I'm going to suggest four areas, four things that we should think about that affect the future of special libraries, of libraries, in fact, of all kinds. And I'll start with something that we often call disruptive or sometimes interruptive technologies. This is a concept that was first written about in 1995 by a, a Harvard professor named Clayton Christensen who wrote about distance uh, disruptive technologies catching the wave was the initial article that he wrote in the Harvard Business Review. This has sometimes been called disruptive innovation or interruptive technologies, but we live in a time when technologies can be disruptive. That well-known authoritative source Wikipedia says that disruptive technologies and disruptive innovation are terms used to describe innovations that improve a product or service in ways that the market does not expect. Does not expect. And they are threatening to leaders of an existing market because they are competition coming from an unexpected direction. Now, thinking about disruptive technologies, I'm going to go back for a moment if I can figure out. Oops. How to do that? Oops, can't do that. There we go. It happens first in the consumer world. If you can imagine disruptive technologies such as ATM machines, that is a disruptive technology. When was the last time you had to wait until the bank opened to go get some money? 
I can't remember. When was the last time you had to go to uh, an American Express to, office to buy a traveler's check because you were going overseas and needed to take cash with you? That's a disruptive technology. Zappos, the great shoe chain online, is a disruptive technology, for I now buy probably 95% of all my shoes. Amazon is a disruptive technology, and we can go on and on and on in that list. But these disruptive technologies not only affect our consumer world, they affect the information world as well. They affect the way people expect to be served in libraries or library-like organizations. And it behooves us to pay attention to these technologies and to adopt them, because our consumer our audience expects them, and if we don't deliver them, we can see already that Google and many others are delivering services traditionally set aside for libraries because we have ignored that. So disruptive technologies is one force. Disintermediation, what you might think of as the do-it-yourself world, the individualization or personalization world, is a second trend that affects libraries and particularly affects specialized libraries. We all know what disintermediation is, I think. Everyone is a researcher. Everyone can use Google. Everyone can find expert information because they can do it themselves. It's sometimes thought of as the rise of the individual. It is connected in some ways with the millennial generations who are the force that brings uh, individual use of things, self-service and so on, to the forefront. So disintermediation means that in the special library world, especially, particularly, Libraries can close or be outsourced and people don't initially notice because they are able to use these tools themselves or at least they think they are able to use these tools themselves. The coin can be turned over, however, and it means that we can also use our particular expertise to do things that are more difficult or more challenging or more interesting or more complex than routine searches. So there's a good news, bad news thing in the world of disintermediation, but it is a force that allows our management to think that our services are no longer needed because people can do research for themselves. The third trend that I would mention that affects not only special libraries, but all kinds of libraries, is the trend toward mobility. Um, I tried this talk out on my Tuesday night class at Maryland, and when I got to this point, somebody raised their hand and said, soon everything will be so tied to mobility that it will be pointless for you to say it. It will be redundant, in fact, for you to say it because we're going to assume that when people are searching and GPSing and looking for the next Starbucks on the corner or whatever it is they're doing, they're doing it on a mobile device. 90% of the world now lives in a place with access to mobile networks. China alone has over 900 million mobile phone users. In India, mobile accounts, mobile use accounts for nearly 90% of all internet use. And very surprising to me, 48 million people have set, live in places where they have cell phones but no electricity. By 2014, hardly any time at all, mobile will be the most common way that the world accesses the internet. And by the following year, smartphones will be the primary enabler of consumer shopping. Looking at this trend in the world of libraries, in the world of special libraries in particular, we need to think about offering content that lends itself to this format. We need to think about content that pushes out in this format. And we need to think about how we package information that is not suited for this format, because it will be, cause a profound change. Many technology changes in organizations come from the bottom because people learn in school, they bring new technology initiatives into organizations, but this is one of the few that I see coming from the top down as well. When I walk around Dow Jones headquarters in New York, all the executives are carrying iPads. I'm going to assume they know how to use them, but they're certainly carrying them around because they think it is the you know, cool thing to do as well. And then the fourth and final thing I'm going to mention, because it is particularly close to the heart of SLA, is the idea of alignment. 
two years ago, three years ago actually, published two years ago, SLA did quite an extensive alignment project trying to understand not how we change the world's perception of libraries and information services, but how the world understands it and how we can adapt to and follow in synchronicity with that world. And our response, uh, which you can find on our website, by the way, uh, gratis, is that we first have to understand what is called the C-suite and how they think and what they think is important. And one very key finding of that study was that they think we are important, but we need to bring more value to the organization by not simply searching and retrieving and archiving and selecting, but by adding our intelligence on top of that, our analysis and our capability of organizing and adding value over the top of research. So they don't want us to be passive collectors, organizers, and searchers. They want us to be active participants. We also need to learn the lingo. We need to understand the words that have power in the C-suite and in the management suite so that we use those words effectively when we are writing our proposals, when we are completing our annual reports, when we are honing our elevator talks, and when we interact with them. Knowledge, which implies that we add a dimension beyond information, is also the bridge that is important to the C-suite. So SLA has created an alignment toolkit. It's available on our website. It contains things as simple as cover letters and models for annual reports to things that are more profound that incorporate the learnings from this extensive study. And it allows us to begin to understand better the power of words and our role in the world. I want to close by telling you a short story um, that will possibly be shocking to you because it was certainly shocking to me. In one of my roles at Dow Jones, I manage the corporate advisory board, which is made up of 15 individuals from our top customers who manage the information functions in their organizations. They have various titles. Some of them are chief information officers. Some are chief knowledge officers. Some are vice presidents of information services, a variety of titles. And every year when we meet annually, and we're going to do that again in a week and a half, we ask them where they came from in terms of their academic preparation. How many of you have an MLS, MLIS, or similar degree? And over time, that number has consistently been about half. About half of them come from our background. This last year, and I'm going to ask again in a couple of weeks, but this last year for the first time, the half that said they had an MLS or similar degree said, and I have removed that credential from my resume. Because people have preconceived conceptions of what that background means, and it impedes my career by putting me in a box that I have a very hard time getting out of. I find that dismaying and shocking in a way and not surprising in another way. Because we contain in our minds the knowledge, skill, and capability that should make us the information rulers of the world. We know how to do this, and we know how to advise our organizations to do it as well. And if we fail to make that case, then we are indeed in a box that we cannot escape from. So my advice to you in thinking about libraries of the future um, and include things like being an embedded librarian, as Dave and others here have uh, championed for so long, but also begin to think about calling ourselves a variety of things that describe what we do, but maybe don't always use traditional words. Use words that describe our capability and our value to our organizations, because we truly are the information and knowledge leaders of the future, and we truly do have the capabilities that will make a competitive difference in our organizations. So we live in a time of stress. It's the best of times, and it is the worst of times. Some things you learn best in calm, but I think you learn some things best in storm. We are in a period of storm, but also in a period of tremendous opportunity.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I now would like to introduce Susan Hildreth uh, to you all. Uh, Susan Hildreth was appointed as the director of the Institute of Museum and Library, Library Services on January 19th, 2011, after being confirmed by a unanimous vote of Congress. With extensive experience in public librarianship, Susan came to the IMLS from Seattle, Washington, where she held the post of city librarian for the, the Seattle Public Library. Previously, she was appointed the California State Librarian and worked for the San Francisco Public Library, holding first the position of Deputy City Librarian and then City Librarian. Susan graduated magna cum laude, excuse me, cum laude from Syracuse University and holds a master's degree in library science, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, from the State University of New York at Albany. Her first position after her MLS was that of a branch librarian for the Edison Township Library in New Jersey, after which she obtained a master's degree in business administration from Rutgers University. Susan served in many capacities at the American Library Association, in addition to that of the 2006 president of the Public Library Association a visionary who understands the importance of libraries to their communities and who works to achieve strategic, strategic growth in order to meet the needs of, the, of a diverse population, Susan's perspective to the future of libraries in the 21st century brings another pillar to our conversation tonight. Wherever the path less follow takes her, we welcome Susan Hildreth to the Catholic University of America School of Library and Information Science Centennial Celebration Library Leaders Luminaries Panel. I give you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Sorry, and just putting your over here. We're getting there. We'll get there. Sorry. Uh, Where does it she say beginning? I think I can. Oh, wait a minute. Uh oh. That took my away. Sorry, guys. Just a sec. Okay. That one. Now we just have to hit. There we go. Uh, yeah. Here we go. That should. Oops. There we go. There we go. All right. We're all set. Okay. Well, thank you for that generous introduction. And Anne, that was great. I really, I mean, not that I knew you were going to be great, but that was very great. And I loved your slides. And I have to say that my slides are too text heavy, uh, but I'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much for asking me to join you this evening. I, I first wanted to make sure that everybody knew what IMLS was. Now I know this is family, so I think most of you do, but I often go out in the world and no one in Washington knows what it is. So IMLS, Institute of Museum and Library Services, and we are the federal voice for the nation's libraries and museums. We're a fairly new agency. We were created in 1996 from the Office of Museum Services and the Library Department coming out of the State Department of Education. Uh, we're excited, our legislation was reauthorized in uh, December of 2010, and we have a renewed focus on our service impact to citizens, uh, working on literacy and workforce development. So just quickly, we do, we have we do a number of activities. I think most people think of us as a grant-making agency. That's our primary activity. But we also do research. Uh, we, do, we collect statistics. We develop policy. Uh, and we also have some great national initiatives and partnerships. So when I was asked to talk about the future of libraries, I, I thought, you know, what I'd like to do is try to share with you a little bit about IMLS's strategic plan. When I was at the Seattle Public Library, we had to do a strategic plan. It took us at least a good year to do it. But we got it done before I left and came to DC, and I thought, OK, I'm capping off the strategic plan. And I get to DC, and the people at IMLS say, guess what? We have to do a new strategic plan. I was like, oh, no. I mean, if any, I know how many of you out there have been through a strategic plan process. They're, they're great, but they can be tedious. So anyway. We had to develop a new strategic plan. Every federal agency is required to have a strategic plan, and they have to be renewed every several years. So our plan is so 
draft, we're getting ready to present it to our board next week, that we still uh, have not developed our official uh, PowerPoint with wonderful pictures and stats and all that kind of thing. So this is a homegrown deal. So I apologize, it's too wordy. But um, I, I think this power, the, I think our strat plan embodies where uh, at least I see and I think our federal agency sees libraries moving in the future. It's probably fairly um, directed to public libraries, but I think all kinds of libraries could take some of these um, thoughts and keep them in mind. So first we have our uh, vision and mission, and our vision, of course, is very outward looking, and I would just really encourage everybody, think about whatever you're doing, what is the impact of your customer base. It's not about you want to have a great library, you want to have a great society where communities and individuals thrive. I think it's really important to get that high level view to put into context the work that we're doing. And our mission here really shows what IMLS does. Now the challenge of IMLS is that we serve to build capacity in libraries and museums. And that's a wonderful task and we're happy to do it, but our current administration uh, is very interested in impact on citizens. So we have to try to develop through our partners measures to of how we're impacting citizens even though our clients, our target audiences are libraries and museums. So that's a challenge that we have. Um, We've identified some key values, and I think this was a good process for our organization, and I would recommend it for any of you. The values are not surprising in any way, but uh, I think it was good to articulate them, particularly uh, working for the public good. We're fostering strategic, innovative, practical investments for the future. We think integrity um, at our federal agency is very important. In fact, our review plot process is known as the gold standard in Congress, so that's good. Uh, collaboration for me is important because survival of any kind, I think, is all about collaborating in partnerships. If you're not able to determine uh, and align yourself with partners, and the alignment slide was really interesting, aligning with the with the head guys in the C-suite. That was I have to think I have to remember that. Who is my C-suite? <laughs> figure out who they are. Everybody better forget, figure that out. Anyway, partnerships are really cr uh, critical, and of course, continuous learning. And I think in our profession, with the pace of technological change. Continu continuous learning is really critical. So we identified five key goals. I'm gonna talk briefly about each of the goals, uh, but I'd like you to think about these in terms of your own institution. Um, our first goal, um, looking at uh, engaging learning experiences is really all about learning um, and the role that we can play in the informal uh, educational ecosystem. Community anchor institutions, uh, I think that really is kind of a buzzword. It comes from the National Broadband Plan. Many of you that are involved in any of that broadband work know that schools, libraries, and hospitals are known as community anchor institutions, and I think it's a very good way to get our message across. Um, discovery of knowledge and cultural heritage. The cultural heritage piece really is for our museum partners at IMLS, but, but this particular goal is all about content and no matter how we package that content or what we do with it, content is really uh, king in the world of libraries. We also want to make sure we develop policies to sustain access to knowledge and that we um, manage our organization as effectively as possible. This is our full goal for learning. Uh, you can read that yourself. And I'm sure that hopefully you'll be able to share the PowerPoint with folks with this information if they want it. Um, Later on, I'd be happy to do that. So how are we really focusing on learning? The way we want to do that, and the way I would encourage most libraries to think about doing that is promoting learning for individuals of all kinds of geographic, cultural, special needs, and socioeconomic socio uh, backgrounds, because libraries can promote and can be an inclusive and accessible learning place that really very few institutions in our communities can fulfill that role other than the libraries. Also at IMLS, we're going to share best practices based on learning research 
to provide effective programs for all, so for all of you that might be interested in providing those kind of very impactful learning experiences, we're gonna provide you with research and best practices to help advise you how to do that. Also, we believe that partnerships that are really learner focused can leverage community assets in your community. So there are lots of folks that are doing learning in your communities, no matter what they may be. So find those folks and try to partner with them so you could leverage your strengths and their strengths. And finally, for IMLS, we support library leaders to be prepared to meet the changing needs um, of our society, which we know is really, really a big challenge. Some of you may be very aware of an initiative that we've been working on for several years, Museums, Libraries, and 21st Century Skills. We have a lot of information regarding this on our website, including a self-assessment tool for your organization and your community, helping you do a community learning scan. But um, the focus of the 21st Century Skills Initiative is that we really want to promote our libraries and other community partners as those institutions that can create creative thinking, problem solving, um, knowledge identification, the skills that our students need and they're not necessarily receiving in their schools, uh, but they must receive to be successful in the 21st century. Uh, another uh, activity we have right now that um, is a good uh, example of partnerships is our working with the MacArthur Foundation. We're providing funds uh, that'll support the creation of learning labs in libraries, it's based on a model that was done at the Chicago Public Library. Now the interesting, th this is a great partnership and we have leveraged one-to-one -one federal dollars for private dollars. But what I wanted to mention just quickly about this for all of you to just keep in mind is that the federal government, as you all know, I mean, you're here in DC, we're experiencing very difficult times. Our budgets are going down, 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 and sadly. And in IMLS, we have many great uh, competitive projects that we can't fund. So out of a recent initiative sponsored by the Department of Education called Innovation to, um, in a, wait, wait, I'm the, I'm sorry, three eyes. In a, um, innovation, well anyway, it's about innovation, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> anyway, uh, there was $650 million to support these innovations projects. And they were all funded, but there were many more projects than could be funded. And through the help of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Department of Education has created something called a foundation registry. And the purpose of the foundation registry is that private funders in the world who are interested in education or library projects or whatever the subject matter, but may not have departments to vet lots of applications, can sign on to this Department of Ed foundation registry and have access to vetted, competitively vetted applications. And in the case of the I3 grants, probably 40% of the grants that they weren't able to fund were funded by private organizations that match their interests with grants. So we're gonna attempt to do this with all our IMLS grants because we have tons and tons of grants that are great that we cannot afford to fund. Uh, I think again, as I said, the community anchor institution role is absolutely critical and that is the role we really need to make sure our policymakers and elected officials are aware of. Uh, in order to fulfill that at IMLS, we're going to invest in projects that strengthen libraries as core, community, community, core parts of our community. We're also partnering with other federal, federal agencies to try to model what those partnerships would look like and ensure that public and private sector leaders know how valuable libraries are. Uh, some of the things that we're doing and I think all of you are very much aware of this in all your sectors, is <clears throat> working with uh, broadband. Now broadband, in order for our communities to really be competitive, we must have access and adoption of broadband. And F the IMLS was asked by the FCC and the National Broadband 
broadband plan to develop a framework for digital communities. And we have done that. The information on the framework is on our website. We just uh, finished up a cross-country roadshow from LA to Bangor, Maine, getting community feedback and elected uh, and appointed official feedback about this framework to see how is this going to work in your, your community. If your community is not supporting digital inclusion, is not making sure that folks that normally wouldn't be connected get connected. How can we help you bring that discussion uh, to the table? And I think the library, as a convener of those discussions, can re really raise the visibility of the library from a public library, community college library, academic library. Um, another partnership that we're involved with um, is with the Department of uh, Labor, and it was great to hear about your work with the Department of Labor. We're working, we are working with the training administration to make sure that the training folks that operate one shop, one stops all over the country understand the value of libraries, particularly public libraries, and work closely with them. Many libraries have taken over the role of one stops, and in some cases, the one stops have located in libraries around the country. We also funded a large project through the North Carolina State Library and another partner, Web Junction. I'm sure some of you are familiar with them, and we have, we have trained I believe over 1,800 public librarians, and not, they're not all, all public librarians, but 1,800 librarians to be able to serve really as job coaches at their public library with folks that are looking for jobs in these difficult times. So I'm not, for some reason, this isn't moving forward. Did we get, okay, we got through, I, pu I punched it with my heavy fist there. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about content and I feel so strongly about content. Um, content, as I said, is king, queen, whatever you wanna say, but we can't just have content for content's sake. We have to provide great access to that content. When Ann was talking about value added to basic information, that's what we need to do with content as well. We have to make sure we're giving space for creating our own content, adding that value, but also opening up our world, our systems, our organizations to user-generated content. I think it's really critical that we do that um, because it's really going to make us uh, be successful and relevant in the 21st century. Some of the things we specifically do at IMLS is we work on supporting care and management of our nation's collections and we've continued to do that over the years, particularly looking at uh, disaster response. And we consider, we continue to try to work on making sure we have emergency management networks available if there is a disaster in your community and also really promoting uh, the role of the library as a first responder because of many as many of you know when we have really challenging situations in our communities and we lose power or we have storms or whatever it is the library is one of the first places to go back online and everybody's there and it's a very critical role that we play um, we also are working on nationwide strategies to, to expand our access to information. There are many regional resource networks and we really want to do the best we can to try to tie those together to provide more access. Um, we talked about connecting to collections and Equitable access to knowledge. Now, some of you, since you're from the D.C. area, you may remember uh, an organization called the National Commission on Libraries and Information Services that was around for many years to advise the president on uh, information policy. That organization was de uh, disbanded during the Miss Bush administration, and that role has been assumed by IMLS. So it's an important role. It's a fairly new role for us, and we're really trying to figure out how we can manage that role. Um, we're going to make sure that federal policies are in place that provide good access to information. Through our data collection efforts, we're also going to identify trends and provide consistent and reliable data. And that's something that I think everyone can do where what that on their local level as well. Both of these issues in terms of talking about access to information and making sure you have a good case of data for your local library are very important. We're also going to work on supporting and extending a national digital infrastructure that leverages libraries and museums as providers of information. And that, in fact, 
was where Maureen and I were today at a workshop getting ready for a plenary session tomorrow, the Digital Public Library of America. This is really an exciting um, challenge, uh, exciting activity, a challenging activity, but we do believe strongly that we will, uh, that it will move forward. It's um, really planning for a large scale digital library that will make information available to all free of charge. Um, we have many great minds in the room, um, including this activity being managed by the Berkman Center at Harvard, but there are all kinds of people. I think the right types of people representing all parts of the information sector and world are together on this effort. So we hope by 2013 we'll have a proof of concept to share with all of you that this will move forward. But I'm really pleased that all the federal partners who have great amounts of content I, uh, NARA, LOC, the Smithsonian are all involved. IMLS doesn't have content, but we're the distribution network to most of the libraries and museums in the world, and finally, in the, in the US. And finally, I won't spend too much time on this, but um, public management excellence. If you are going to survive in your organization, you have to be managing it in the most effective way possible. And I think there are many ways that we are, um, we're trying to do that at IMLS. Um, evaluation, a culture of planning and evaluation is critical in everything that you do. Uh, a very transparent organization is also critical. But I think what I would like to focus on most is encouraging and promoting an engaged and energized workforce. Um, I'm a strong believer in prudent risk taking. <laughs> And I think, you know, uh, the librarians, uh, I mean, I'm a librarian, we're all librarians, but our librarians often are so focused on getting every single thing right before you try something new. And this age, that, in this age, that's just not going to work. We need to try something new. Maybe we don't have all the I's dotted and T's crossed, but I would rather have my uh, workforce and myself trying something, seeing how it works, fixing it, even scrapping it, because you can learn from failure uh, and you can move ahead. So I think particularly in this day and age, having a very engaged workforce that is willing to take prudent risks and also that is supported by their managers and administration to do that, and sometimes that's scary, uh, it's critical for us to succeed. So hopefully I'll be able to share uh, this information with you, and I do have lots of information about how to get a hold of us. There's tons of stuff on our website. We do have a Twitter account. I don't know that, I can't believe how many, when you gave that statistic about Twitter, about how fast Twitter uh, caught on, because whenever I go on Twitter, it always says there's an error on there. I think, I mean, I'm not sure that they're as robust as some of these other um, uh, Web 2.0 resources, but it's a Web 2.0 world, so we gotta, we gotta be there. So thank you very much. <clears throat> and is the American Library Association 2012-2013 president-elect. Previously nominated as the 2010 Association of College and Research Libraries Academic Research Librarian of the Year, Maureen served as the 1998 and 99 President of the Association of College and Research Libraries and established the Harvard Graduate School Education Leadership Institute for Academic Librarians. Maureen has held many positions in academic libraries in the area of human resource management and management training at both Yale and the University of Maryland College Park before starting her own consulting business in 1991. Specializing in policy, strategic planning, and leadership, Maureen incorporates her love of libraries with insightful knowledge and expertise in library leadership. Planning for the future today is a theme that Maureen speaks about with great optimism, awareness, and understanding. We welcome Maureen Sullivan to the Catholic University of America School of Library and Information Science Centennial Library Luminaries Panel. I broke into a smile because one of the first things I wanted to tell you is that I am very optimistic about the future for libraries and opportunities for librarians. And I was quite struck by Ann's statistic about special libraries and that process that was used to make the point that they're falling away. Something similar is happening with school libraries, but we don't have data or a means to capture the data about what the actual pattern is with school libraries. But let me just put that aside. 
I want to talk with you in the time that I have about some of the themes that you've already been hearing. I chose to accept the nomination for ALA president and president-elect because I felt I was at a time in my career where I was ready to move beyond the work I do out in the field. And a lot of that, of course, is leadership development, as you've heard. But a lot of it has also been working with individual libraries of all types and multi-type organizations, as well as associations, to address the question, how do we transform ourselves? to be vital in our communities, but also to ensure that we are doing the important work for the people whom we're serving in those communities. And when I was campaigning, and then in the months that I've been in the president-elect position, I've focused in four areas. The first of those has been a very strong theme in the comments you've heard already, and that is, what is it that the American Library Association can do to encourage much stronger leadership on the part of its members and particularly leadership in their communities. The second one is learning, to really highlight all of the work that's been done, and I'm gonna suggest it's not just work that's been done in decades past, but for the centuries that libraries have existed. It's very interesting as I reflect on that history, I think we have a very strong pattern of supporting self-directed learning, and yet we're not appreciated for that work. But every time I hear someone answer the question, what was your first experience in a library, or how did libraries matter for you, the answer always includes what the individual was able to do on his or her own. And we have structures that enable that, but we also have experts working in these buildings that help and support that. The third area that I'm very interested in, and it's particularly school librarians, but also academic and public librarians to some extent, have been doing really good work in the area of literacy. And I think we need to strengthen the work that ALA does in that arena. And the fourth area that I'm also interested in supporting is the work that goes on informally around the world where librarians from this country are going out and helping with library development in other countries. And having spent some time at the IFLA conference in Puerto Rico this year, one of the things that was affirmed for me is how much we in the United States can learn from the experience of other countries. I was particularly impressed when I learned about a leadership development that South Africa has had in place now for about two years in the way that they're managing that. So as I'm approaching my work within the American Library Association, I'm bringing a very optimistic view about our possibilities. And a lot of that is shaped by what I learn as I work out in the field and discover we're doing in an informal way. I also, however, have some ideas about what it is that we need to give very strong attention to and where it is that we need to collaborate and be ready to learn through the kind of experimentation that you heard Susan describing. The first is to reinvent libraries so that we're focusing on learning. And I think of this as really reinventing the library as a learning institution and a learning institution in its community. This is an interesting phrase, this anchor institution that the museum or the library might embrace. I hold the view that every community that has a library has a place that acts as a, a community center for that community. And that place is used in a whole variety of different ways. It's interesting to hear President Garvey describe his view of what goes on in the reading room at the Law Library at Harvard. I've spent time in the Law Library at Harvard as a consultant in the last several years, and that reading room is used the way some of your reading rooms and facilities are used as well. And that is, there's a whole host of things that are happening, and reading is taking place in different forms, but there's also a lot of social interaction, and I'm always pleased when I see people who appear to be just sitting in reflection as they are in that space. And of course, that space, as is the case with some of your spaces, is very much designed to support that kind of reflective engagement on topics, issues, or whatever is in one's mind. I believe that libraries, no matter what type they are, are central to community development and transformation. And I apply that to public libraries in their communities, school libraries in their schools, but also academic libraries in the higher education arena. 
I know that there are a number of examples that have taken place in the last decade, and there are more emerging, that really are causing us to rethink the purpose of the physical facility. And one of the interesting experiences I've had in the last couple of weeks is I have a brother who's been active in politics who um, took me aside and said, you know, you really have to keep in mind something about the American Library Association. It's toward the bottom of organizations that are effective lobbyists in uh, Washington. Of course, the Washington office of ALA would not want to hear me say this. But his real point was the strongest lobby is the National Rifle Association. The National Rifle Association has members, has a goal of a gun in every citizen's hands, but the American Library Association has 60,000 members. Those members are dispersed throughout the country in buildings and facilities that are symbols in their community, not only for what they are in providing information and supporting the transfer of information into knowledge, but they're also symbolic places that welcome anyone to come in for any purpose. And we've particularly watched public libraries respond to some of the changing needs with new immigrants, with people who are out of work, and particularly responding to this phenomenon where people can only apply for jobs by doing it by filling out an application on the internet. So very much seeing these as continuing to be community spaces, but for us to think in new and creative ways about different purposes for those spaces. And I also want us to begin to understand content will continue to be important, as Susan has been stressing, but in no matter what type of library we're operating, the experience for the person who currently uses the library, but those in the community who do not use the library, is the key way for us not only to engage people, but for us to achieve the third level in the tool that Susan presented, which you really couldn't see very well, on the screen here, but it comes from the report she cited, Museums, Libraries, and 21st Century Skills. There's a wonderful model in there that suggests that what we really want to move to as museums and libraries is to being embedded in our communities. And I think it's a challenge for us in whatever library we're working to discover the ways in which that can happen in a meaningful process. I also want to suggest that for us as individuals in this field, we play a critical role in helping people develop their skills, in finding information, in tapping the community resources that are there and available, also being able to come together, solve problems together, and to discover more meaningful ways of engaging in our communities. I'm delighted at the number of people, actually it's now six people who have approached me since I won the election, suggesting that one of the things I should take on is having ALA be instrumental in civic conversations or community dialogues. And I think that would be a very smart way for ALA as well as individual librarians to work. I think the challenges that we face from the organizational perspective are ones that can best be met if every one of us in this field begins to adopt the mindset that we are librarians, the degrees that we have, the work experience that we have has been important, but we're in a new world. And we now have the opportunity to really make a difference in what some call the information ecosystem. We're very much a part of that. There are a lot of others who are a part of this, but we, given what we know, the expertise that we have, and the real value that we have for cooperation and collaboration, have the opportunity to be, and here's my phrase, creative entrepreneurs in our work and in the communities that we serve. Been part of a process recently where one of the suggestions that's been made is that libraries begin to think that they hold the promise of transforming the communities in which they exist. And if we're gonna pursue a path where we hope to be central to transformation of communities and meeting the needs of the people whom we serve, the entrepreneurial role becomes very important. I was delighted to hear Anne introduce to you, those of you who have not yet been introduced to it, this concept of disruptive innovation. And for those of you who are working in higher ed, Clay Christensen's new book, The Innovative University, is all about how this is going to apply in higher ed. And I love the phrase that he and his co-author introduced, and that is transforming the DNA of higher education. I want to help foster transforming the DNA of libraries and society. So as we adopt and follow this 
entrepreneurial role, here are my suggestions for us on a more specific level. We need to focus on doing everything we can to enable the people whom we serve to be successful. The second thing is we need ourselves to engage in continuous creative thinking and improvement, to be very reflective, to take the time to be with each other. I learned several years ago to stop thinking myself about spending time on things, but rather more thinking I'm taking the time to do this. It's a way of moving us to be more reflective and to engage with others. We, of course, need to continue to monitor what's changing in our communities and to do that in a way that we're gathering evidence and data that is meaningful. I, I just have to say again as an aside, I'm stunned that there is not a means to track what's happening with school libraries and I hope ALA is going to quickly get on top of that and we'll have it. We also need to continue to focus on creating value in these communities, but to do so increasingly by differentiating what our particular library's contributions might be. And of course, in the area of content, one of the things that's emerged as a theme in the last several years is really paying attention to and highlighting the local content that a particular library may have that others may not. We also need to understand how breakthrough thinking happens. What does it mean? to think in an innovative way, and what are some of the tools and resources that we can learn to use in order to do that. Throughout my career, I'm in groups all the time where the term brainstorming is used, and brainstorming is misunderstood. It's actually a technique, a very simple one to learn to use, where you storm in the brain and get all of the ideas out, and then you begin to evaluate them. We've been in a practice for some time where we're evaluating as we're developing those ideas. And back to one of Susan's points as she was coming to closure, another area for real skill development on the part of many of us is to develop some level of comfort with risk and experimentation. Ron Heifetz in his work at Harvard on understanding how to lead in the future organization uses the phrase embracing disequilibrium. And some of us in this field have developed some comfort with that, but I think it's something that almost all of us need to get ready to do. I also want to just close with an encouragement that you take time to think about what in your work prompts you to think where your passion is, what are your sources of enthusiasm and your sources of satisfaction. And if you ponder that question and you don't come up with anything, this is going to be hard for some to accept. It's time to find something else to do because we are not going to thrive in the future digital world unless we have the majority of us taking the lead and everyone being ready to follow in the whole area of making the changes that are necessary. And it's passion and enthusiasm that will guide us and give us the energy to get where it is that we need to go. We also need to understand our ways of being creative. Every human being is creative. We have different ways of displaying that creativity and the major block for most of us to display our creativity is the assumption that we're not creative. But to shift our thinking and understand that we are, and there's a lot of research, particularly I pay attention to what comes out of Brandeis and Harvard, that continues to support we're all naturally creative. We also need to be responsive and assume self-responsibility. One of the themes in the campaign for me was individuals who were saying ALA needs to do something to get more people to be accountable for their professional growth and their professional development. I think it's up to each of us to take that on personally. I also will close by suggesting that we need to particularly focus on relationships and the set of skills that are so important to building and sustaining a wide variety of relationships. I read an article from the Harvard Business Review about 10 years ago that talked about the importance of bonding with the customer. How's that for a jargony phrase? But when I read this, I thought, this is a core competency of most people who work in libraries that we undervalue. And I think we need to begin to highlight that. I've been working in the last two years with an approach to change that can apply personally with groups, but also organizationally. And I want to leave you with just a brief description of this approach to change. Many of you who are experienced in strategic planning know the SWOT approach, identifying strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. A couple years ago, somebody changed threats to challenges, so it became SWOC. 
the new one that I am enamored of and have been using without telling people I'm using it is called SOAR. And the concept here, of course, is we're soaring to a new vision and an exciting future. And the four components of this are very easy to remember. It begins where I like to begin, and that is with a clarification of strengths. So the S stands for strengths. And we take time to be very deliberative about identifying what the strengths are, what's working in this situation. The second one is opportunities. Out of strengths, we move to a discussion and identification of where are there opportunities for us to make a difference, to really add value, to contribute, to be the anchor institution in our community. The third one is aspirations. And the difference between opportunities and aspirations is with aspirations, we're shifting to what are our dreams? I was with the Greenwich Library the other night. I've been doing strategic planning with them. And I did a series of community conversations. And it was very exciting and energizing for me as well as others in the room when I posed the first question. This community of Greenwich, one of the wealthiest in the country, is the best it can be three to five years from now. What is the library doing in that? And it was wonderful to see how quickly the ideas would flow. And the last one is the results. And sometimes when we're doing strategic planning, we're dreaming, we're creating visions, we don't give proper attention to the results. But one of the reasons why I believe the IMLS assessment process is a gold standard is because it really calls for us to say not only what are the results that we want to achieve, but what are the standards for ensuring that we have quality results out of that. So the last thing I want to say because of my work with uh, the American Library Association and the fact that I'm in the role of president-elect is all of you have until November 4th to go to the ALA website and fill out a form to volunteer for an ALA committee assignment. And if you do that and you send me a message to let me know that you have done that, I'll do everything I can to find a place for you. I have a new ALA.org email and it's very easy to remember. It's msullivan at ALA.org. But of course you have to be a member of ALA for this to work. And I've done all of this assuming that you are members of this association. So I hope you'll join me as we think about the future in focusing on not just strengths and aspirations, but the positive, optimistic view of the possibilities that are there. Because if more of us adopt that view, it's much more likely that we're going to achieve the goals, particularly that Susan laid out as coming from the IMLS strategic plan. Thank you very much. I look forward to being part of the panel, which is the next step in this process. hear me? Yes. All right. So thank you very much. This is wonderful. I, I believe that all of us agree that these uh, presentations are just inspirational. And they, they also pose a lot of uh, questions probably in your mind. So I would like to open up for discussion and questions. Anybody? We'll get started. Yes, Barry. Hello? Oh. OK. Thank you very much for joining us here tonight. I uh, really appreciated um, all of your speeches or your talks. And uh, so we've been fr from uh, C-suites to community streets to a blank canvas. So I, I, I'd like to hear from each one of you just one idea that, we, that you could give all of us tonight so that we could go out and be those creative entrepreneurs or take a small risk or try to affect a small change in our own work to try to, um, to move into that role as a 21st century librarian. Thank you. Well, I'll start, or do you want to go ahead? Uh, I'll go first. <laughs> I would say think carefully about the words you use to describe your capabilities and make those words meaningful to your audience rather than to you. If you say to someone sitting next to you on an airplane, I'm an acquisitions librarian, 
99.5% of them will have no idea what you're talking about. But if you say, I'm the person who makes the best selections, best recommendations, best not, has, the, has the best knowledge of how to acquire the best resources for our organization, they will understand that completely. So move outside the box of labels that we understand into the rest of the world. So I think Maureen talked uh, really articulately about the changing nature of place in libraries. But I am a firm believer that given the rapidly changing proportion of print to digital materials, we're going to see uh, a vast amount of space available in the built physical asset we have in libraries over the next 10, 15, that 20 years, probably five years. But, for an idea, and I would say to everyone, I'm looking for an IMLS application on this. I, I really think libraries have to, and librarians need to be proactive in their communities in starting the conversation about how do we repurpose this space. The community doesn't want to give up the space. They love their local libraries. Um, and it's going to be a different solution for every community, but don't be in a situation where somebody else comes in and says, oh, you don't need that space, we're going to stick the police department in there or something like that. Get a solution developed through your committee, uh, your community already, and maybe you'll have a one-stop, and maybe you'll have a self health center, and maybe you'll have a child care center, but be proactive and purposeful about that because it will put you in a very good place. So I'm going to suggest a tool for getting ready for what you've just heard. Can you hear me? A tool for getting ready um, for what you just heard Susan describe, and it's what I call an influence map. And this is something each of you could do, either this evening or at some point tomorrow. Just take a piece of paper and draw two circles on that piece of paper. And I would have you put yourself in the middle, because that middle, um, core circle is where you can identify what it is that you would bring to the process of influence. But the next circle out would be where you have direct influence. And think creatively about individuals, groups, in the community, in your organization. Fill that out as best you can. And then, of course, outside of that would be those opportunities for influence that are more indirect now that you could begin to start working with once you've really maximized the relationships in that circle of influence. Well, thank you. These are wonderful ideas. One question I have uh, is that right now, especially in Washington, D.C., the, the Congress is just almost dysfunctional. And we are getting, <laughs> it's just uh, very frustrating in, in having some, any kind of impact. And I know that the um, AOA Washington office is working very hard to try to save uh, school libraries. But the question is, uh, what can we do other than calling our senators and calling our representatives in trying to get our voice in? Because it's the, the representatives at Congress that are just not functioning. So you give me a chance to tell you two dreams that I have. They'll never happen. The first is, I'd like to be the person who would be invited in to work with Congress and to help Congress learn how to work collaboratively. The second is, I'd like to see Congress, 10 years from now, be comprised of people coming from their districts, and all of them would be somehow affiliated with libraries. Librarians, trustees, people in the community who are active library users. But of course, very much out in the stratosphere with those ideas. A practical suggestion that I can offer is, I don't think it's enough to call our representatives. I think we need to develop relationships with those representatives. And I think we need to do it individually, and we also need to do it with groups. I know that there are other professions and other sectors where it's front and center to be in the congressional office. How do you think the NRA became the lobby that it did? It has developed relationships. It, members of the NRA go hunting with members of Congress. I'm not suggesting that we do that. But I do think we need to develop those relationships. And in getting ready to develop them, we need to do our research, a core co a capability of us, and really understand what it is that those individuals are interested in and how it is that we can get them engaged because we've matched 
what we're about to talk about or offer with what it is that they're interested in. I just want to briefly address the situation with the uh, school library statistics. So um, some of you may be familiar with uh, an enti entity called NCES, National Center for Education Statistics. So for many years, that's embedded in the Department of Ed, and they did all kinds of statistics. And several years ago, they said to libraries, we're not going to do you do statistics for you anymore. You're kind of a, you know, you're a, a one-off thing. We don't, you know, we don't want to collect your statistics. So that's now what IMLS is doing. Now, because schools are embedded in the educational infrastructure, NCES is still supposed to be collecting their statistics. But what I can tell you is the last couple of days I've had people talking to me about these statistics. So I'll go back with my statistics folks, my research, research folks, and see if there's anything we could do in terms of taking that from NCES. We took it for libraries. Maybe we can take it for school libraries. We must be able to show the information about the decline. The other thing I would say, if anybody has information that you know about that shows the impact of school libraries, particularly on the performance and testing of students, send that into the Washington office. You have a person, you have the staff in the Washington office of ALA who are relentless about getting the word out about school libraries. So they're doing the best they can in a, in a tough time. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, any other questions or ideas? Comments? Dave. Thank you all for being here tonight and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, whenever I go to professional uh, meetings and, and presentations of any kind, these days, I'm always on the lookout for how many times the word library is used and how many times the word librarian is used. And I heard a lot more library than I did librarian tonight, overall. Uh, a couple of years ago, a woman named Judy Cease wrote an article in which she envisioned a future in which librarians thrived, but libraries did not. And I just wonder if each of you would comment on the distinction between the librarian and the library, the future of the profession, and the future of the institution. Why did I know you were going to say that, David? <laughs> SLA has uh, between nine and 10,000 members, as Dave well knows, because he's a member of SLA. And about 20% of those call themselves librarians or have a similar name in their title, leaving the remainder to be assorted in the two, about 2,000 other job titles. I don't care, actually, what you call yourself. I think I care much more passionately about the expertise you bring to the table. And whether the, in the special libraries world, the institution, the, the box that is the library, the place down the hall behind the mahogany doors and the reference desk is disappearing rapidly, as you very well know, and I've led the uh, charge to keep us informed about that. But the function of the librarian or whatever of those other 2,000 things you call yourselves has become more vital than ever. So I don't care what you call yourselves, but I care quite a lot about the expertise that you bring. And if the library as an institutional box disappears in the special libraries world, I'm not particularly worried about that as long as that function and expertise resides in the heart, the beating heart, if you like, of organizations. Okay, well, I don't want to be too heretical here, but uh, I'm going to do it. Um, I believe that our librarians are a critical element of how we help our communities. But I also believe that ha staffing our libraries with librarians sitting at a desk who are there just uh, in case someone has a question is not the same thing as deploying people as effectively as possible. Uh, and I think about the great and all-powerful Oz behind that curtain, and don't we want the librarian to be considered as the great and all-powerful librarian? So my vision for librarians is uh, I don't think 
their, their strengths and skills are mostly effectively used by having them sit at a desk. Given the nature of interactions and questions we have, and Google has changed that, and said that, everybody thinks they're a li they can be a librarian even though they can't. So in order to effectively run our institutions, and one of the ways to do that is to have, any, have these institutions as open as often as possible, I'm really a firm believer of using our librarian skills in a very intentional manner and having them available for adding value to content, doing outreach, talking with the community, doing programming, being available when someone needs them, working on a telephone line. But uh, I feel that the traditional way we've had of staffing libraries, in particular public libraries, and I think to some extent academic libraries well, as well, is uh, expensive and not the best use of our skills. So I truly believe in librarians, but if a librarian comes into an institution and says, we know I'm just gonna sit by this desk and wait for people to come and ask me a question, that's not gonna work. It's probably not the ALA answer. <laughs> I, I don't know, we'll see. This isn't gonna be the ALA answer, this is Maureen's answer. I share the view that the emerging new work for librarians is going to be out in the communities that they're serving, and I think the strongest role will be the education or supporting the learner role. I also think this question takes us right back to why we're here this evening, and that is we're here to celebrate a school that was founded to prepare people for practice. We're at a time where I think we need to go through a fundamental rethinking of what is the work that we do, who needs to be doing that work? What are the capabilities for that? And it takes me right into a question I got on a different program on Monday. What did I think about the curricula in library school? And were library and information schools really preparing people for the digital world? And my answer to that very simply is, I don't think it's happening. And of course, I said that, and some of you know Tula Giannini at Pratt. She immediately talked about what they were doing at Pratt, and somebody mentioned what was going on at Drexel. But we're really at a time we're in this field. We have to have a collective effort to step back and look at the whole system for preparing people to do the vital work that I think all three, all four of us on this panel are very much eager to see continue. I agree. I think that one part of it is that it's very much we need to be engaging with our community whether those are school children or whether they are college students or people in the community, just the general public. Because without going to engage them, without showing them how much we can contribute to their lives, we, our future will be in danger. And the whole point, I think this particular field, uh, our mission is to enable people to be more productive, to throw, uh, make their life better. And if we don't take a proactive approach, we eventually will become irrelevant. Yeah. Any other? Comments, I would welcome comments. Yes. Good evening, uh, can, can you hear me? Uh, I'm uh, Bill Turner, and class of 1996. And <clears throat> thank you very much for your remarks this evening. I, I find them um, inspiring and stimulating and illuminating. And I would like to give another perspective based on a book that I've been reading recently. And it's called The World Without Us. And the author is Alan Weinstein. And it, it is a fascinating book. The premise is what would happen if human beings disappeared from the face of the earth? tomorrow, if we were all uh, abducted into outer space or if there was a, a, re, a rapture and we were all carried away or uh, if we all died in a plague or something. But what would happen to our institutions and uh, the, the, the buildings, the, the infrastructure, um, <clears throat> by what processes would nature uh, reclaim uh, the, the buildings and structures and, and how long would it take? How, how long would it take Manhattan to become pristine again, for example? Uh, not as long as you might think. But on that model, um, 
S suppose um, libraries were, were to disappear uh, from the face of the earth tomorrow, and uh, well, it, uh, we, we've been talking about the, the, the relation of li librarians and, and, and libraries, that there would still be librarians. So how would the librarians repurpose themselves without, uh, with, without libraries? Um, and, and then would, would libraries, uh, you know, how, how would we, would, would we restart libraries as they exist now, or how, how, would, we, how would we rethink them? But I, I just think that this book, uh, The World Without Us, uh, has carryover implications to how we might uh, rethink uh, libraries, you know, a, a world with or without libraries. So if you want to kick that around, feel free. I think it's a great question for us to consider individually. It's also a great question for us to engage our colleagues in discussing. Because one of the ways I think about your question, Bill, is the digital world creates the means for us to work separate from physical facilities. And already we have a number of people who are working in that way. And for us to use that as the stepping off point to think about, if we were to create any one of our libraries today, what would we create? And I think that's what the digital context offers us the opportunity to do. And I say all of that believing libraries as facilities will continue, but I also think we're going to significantly rethink their use and their purpose. And we're going to have more librarians not working in those physical facilities. In the world of special libraries, this has already happened. And we are surviving just fine. So there is hope. You know, I, I certainly hope it doesn't happen. But uh, I think about all the people who basically exist today without libraries. They never use them. So some of those people get their information in other ways. Some of those people have the means that they don't, for convenience sake or whatever, use the library, but they certainly want to have the library in their community for people that don't have other means. And I've often found that in polling for you know, support in terms of, of, of funding measures. But um, I, I'm really impressed with Maureen's hopeful, <laughs> optimistic answer. Um, I, I just think that it's amazing to see how uh, people have connected themselves in a networked way. And I think that we would see some kind of huge, giant barter system. I mean, we already have people bartering and trading books and online without the purpose, without the library institution. So. Um, because we're so networked in a way, not, not necessarily as much as our community as by interest, but I think there would evolve some kind of ecosystem because I believe that um, at least those living in America today, uh, maybe not in future generations, still do feel that we should have some access and ability to share information. I just want to add one thing quickly. I think it's really important for all of us to bear in mind that as human beings, we have a basic need to find meaning and purpose in what we do. And as we're thinking about these issues for the future of libraries, we should stay focused on what is the meaning and purpose that people in our communities are seeking, and where are there opportunities for the library to respond to that? Uh, Bill, I wrote a little essay for Educause about four or five years ago, if the academic library didn't exist, would we have to invent it? And it basically sets up a straw man where excellent college in the middle of Ohio is going to give a rebate to all the students of the percentage of their tuition that goes to support the library, which was about $1,200 at the time. Well, it doesn't take two months 
before they're all subscribing to the databases individually, giving out the passwords to their friends. <laughs> and also, they left the library where it was. The books are there, the building's there, they left it there, and it's now the honor system. Just, if you look under Lynn Scott Cochran on the web and Educause, you'll find it. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much for that wonderful note. Um, I always believe that our, our graduates, really, they can apply their knowledge and skills in any kind of information environment, and they don't necessarily need to tie themselves to a physical structure. And so I strongly endorse uh, Maureen's idea is that think about what your users need, what's meaningful in their lives, in what way you can help them. And we can help them maybe from a library, but I believe that library will need to evolve. The way we provide access to, to, to information, the way we help them make sense of information, that has to change. And so, in a way, even though it sounds very challenging, I believe that there are a lot of opportunities for us to become very, to stay and become even more relevant than today. Yep, it's nine o'clock. I was reminded. <laughs> so, any other questions? One last question, comments? No? Well, in, in that case, then please join me in thank you, our, our panelists. <laughs>